Thanks very much, and, and thanks in particular to Audit New Zealand for inviting me here today. Um, and I appreciate that um, talking about fraud is a bit like yelling fire in a crowded theatre. It gets a reaction. Um, but that's sort of what I'm after, to a large extent. Um, I do want to shake people out of a little bit of complacency, because I think that's one of our biggest risks. I um, also want to take advantage of the fact that I've got a room full of people that I'm talking to about fraud um, who are here voluntarily um, and who aren't uh, being talked to as potential suspects. So um, a lovely, smiling, happy crowd. Wonderful. Not what I'm used to. Um, in terms of what I do want to cover as well, um, it's ambitious, it's the, the future of fighting fraud in the public sector. Um, probably not quite as ambitious as Peter having to guess what's happening with oil prices or Brexit. Um, I don't envy those tasks, but what I would like to do is, I suppose, talk a little bit about what the SFO does, dispel any myths or mystery around, around that, because I won't presume that you know much or anything about us. Um, talk about what we're seeing at the moment. So what are the trends, what are some of the individual cases, and, and what are we concerned about? Um, and also, to, to leave on an uplifting note, talk about what we're doing to respond to that. Because I think New Zealand does have, have some systemic issues around uh, what the way in which it deals with, with fraud in the, in the public sector, and, and corruption in particular. And there's also some, some legal challenges as well. Um, uh, we're, we've, our legislation um, needs a bit of a dust off, and um, we're working towards that. So that, that will be a, a light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. Um, I'll start out by just talking very briefly about who we are. I won't take you through an organisation chart of the SFO that will start an early run at the buffet. Um, the, the point of that, I suppose, is to say that there's 50 of us, so we're not large. And of those 50, um, there's 35, give or take, operational staff. Um, not a huge number. A and I suppose the other thing to note, we're, we're a little bit unique as well in terms of how uh, we investigate crime, um, in that we get the complaints in, we review them, we triage them, we commence an inquiry, we might commence an investigation, and then we go all the way through to a prosecution, taking it to trial, sentencing, the whole lot. That's quite unique in the sense that we don't uh, look at a crime, investigate it, wrap it up, and then hand it to some independent prosecutor or some separate agency. And that's deliberate. It's modelled on the UK SFO approach because we take the view, and this is seen as best practice internationally, that the types of cases we look at, you effectively end up investigating them twice, if you like, if you look at them at an investigative level and then wrap them off and send them somewhere separately. So we do look at them th throughout their, their life cycle. Um, the, the thing to note, I suppose, is the, I suppose the, the view can be taken, it, does that affect our independence? We would obviously say no, and we have a, a director who makes the, the prosecution and the investigation decisions, and, and her, her decisions can't be called into question by, by a court, so that there is that independence in that sense, and there's also complete political independence. We do not have political interference or even involvement or, or any detailed knowledge unless absolutely necessary for extraordinary circumstances into our cases. So we do have that independence. Um, we also have a separate panel of uh, barristers who act on our cases, who, who, who lead them at the prosecution end in conjunction with an SFO team. And again, that just gives that measure of independence where they're giving us their expert legal advice, but also that cross-check, I suppose, that we're taking the right cases. Um, in terms of those cases, Serious Fraud Office Act 1990, um, somewhat old, sort of a little bit fit for purpose, I suppose. Doesn't define fraud, which is interesting. Um, but what we're left with is what what is at the moment a pretty narrow mandate to investigate, um, detect, and prosecute serious or complex fraud. What that means is that conversations like I'm having today to try and give you some insight, they're not part of our core mandate at the moment, um, which I think is, and I'll, I'll go on to belabour this point, a, a little bit of a gap, I suppose. Our mandate is narrow, and with our 35 operational staff, what that results in is about 10 to 12 prosecutions a year, um, which is, for the office the size we are, is a large number. But ultimately, unless you can leverage off that, unless you can get the learnings of that out there, actually get the lessons disseminated into the relevant communities or, or sectors or, or segments of, of the country, um, then we aren't having full impact for that. All you've got at the end of your 12 prosecutions is 30 people in jail. Great, that's a, a necessary thing, but it's quite a blunt instrument. Um, so we do need to do better as a country in terms of how we tackle fraud and corruption, particularly in the public sector. In terms of how we, how we look at cases, um, there are a few things we look at. Um, the, the first thing is the, the scale, the number of victims or the, or the financial value. 
to be honest, it's all about context in that I have read in the papers that our financial threshold is some magical figure of 1 million, 2 million, and I've even read 5 million. Um, I, like Auckland property prices going up for no apparent reason with no basis. Um, the reality is, if you're in the middle of the GFC and Hanover and Bridge Corp are falling over and $500 million is being lost, a million dollar case isn't very big. Um, in more normal financial times, it might be. So it is all about context. It's certainly a, a, a factor that we look at, and the number of people affected is even more of a factor. Um, so the, it's probably fair to say anything under a million dollars may not make, take our attention, but it depends on a number of other things. Um, public interest, and I do draw a, a very important distinction between public interest and what the public might be interested in. They are different things. Um, what we will look at is if it's public funds or there is a public impact. Um, and in that sense, um, we will take cases where we think there's a, a real, I suppose, systemic risk or a widespread interest in that case being pursued. If it's just person A and person B who have a beef, it may well be fraud between, them to, between the two of them. But we have to question whether that's a good use of our limited resource to intervene in that one-to-one -one situation. Are we getting maximum value for New Zealand's money in intervening in that? Um, on the other hand, two of the biggest cases we took last year were two massive mortgage frauds, one in the residential uh, lending sector, another in the commercial lending sector. They were really important cases for us to take. Um, not the sexiest prosecutions in the world, I can assure you, we weren't doing it for our, for our entertainment, but really important in the sense that they were of such a scale that they were distorting, they had the potential to distort the residential lending market and the commercial lending market um, in relation to property, and that, that's, a, that's a huge risk for New Zealand. Um, we also had professionals facilitating that fraud, lawyers and accountants willing to put their practicing certificates on the line um, and accountants doing the same thing um, in order to facilitate that fraud. Um, massively important that we send the message to those professional bodies that that won't be tolerated. Similarly, within the banks themselves, the frauds couldn't happen in either instance without an insider facilitating it. And we've sat down and have a number of conversations with financial institutions about how they deal with misconduct. Because what we were seeing, and what we continue to see to a certain extent, although I'd like to think it's getting less, is people having an issue within their organisation, detecting it, spotting it, and moving them on. Saying, right, we're the blue bank, we're going to move that to the yellow bank. Um, that person, we've got it, out the door. That's not okay. That's not a way in which to deal with this problem. Um, all you are, all you're doing, is passing that issue on to another person. Um, so again, that that was really important that we could stamp down on that insider element um, to this type of conduct. And so that's that's just one example where that was a real systemic risk to New Zealand. So we took that those two cases. Um, complexity, legal, factual, evidential. In that sense, we like to think of ourselves as having particular expertise in these types of cases. We do them better. We have a, a, a core of accounting expertise, investigative expertise, and legal expertise that isn't held anywhere else in the country. Um, the police do uh, a great job at certain levels of fraud, but they're simply not resourced and set up to do it. And the recent events of Christchurch just demonstrate that certain things uh, just have a bigger priority, and they have to have a bigger priority. But we don't have to prioritise, we just do financial crime. Um, whereas within the police, where they have fraud, that will get deprioritised, um, as it has to do in certain circumstances. The last one, and this is a really important one, the nature and consequences, um, uh, for example, corruption. The point there is we might have monetary thresholds and how many people are affected for most other types of offending, but if it is public sector money and it is public sector corruption, we will come down on that as hard as we can. We've taken a case for a $1,000 bribe within a, um, a local government context. We lost that case, but that's okay. That was the right case to take, and that demonstrates that that's just not going to be tolerated. Um, and, and that's massively important um, in the sense that, and there's our strategic plan, lots of um, blue and orange up there, which I, I can't read and I'm closer than you are. But th the point of that is to say that New Zealand being a safe place to invest and do business and our reputation for being corruption free is massively important. It's a huge brand for New Zealand. We are typically top of the Transparency International Index for not being corrupt effectively. It is just a perceptions index. But I know engaging with our overseas colleagues, that perception is real to the extent that they rely on it. They see it as a real thing. It's of enormous value to us and we need to protect that. And I often draw parallels with our uh, environmental image. Again, if you attend or, or engage with um, other jurisdictions, that perception of us being clean and green and 100% pure, that's, that's real. 
people do see that and perceive that as being the case. A lot of people in this room will be pretty cynical about that, whether it's actually the reality. But that's a different question. It's certainly perceived that way. And what we're trying to do in relation to corruption is probably a little similar to what we're not trying to do with our environmental um, reputation, which is to close that gap between perception and reality. And if I might be facetious, quick before anyone notices, because at the moment we're perceived as being not very corrupt, partly because our corruption looks a little different to other countries, partly because um, we're not very good at spotting it and, and, and raising a hand when it does occur. But we need to make sure we, we do better, that we're not complacent about it. Um, otherwise, that reputation, which we trade off, believe me, we absolutely trade off it, um, that will go. Um, in terms of emerging risks and vulnerabilities, there's a few sort of... Uh, overarching ones which, which are sort of unique to New Zealand. Our population growth, and this has been, been touched on to a certain extent by, by my colleagues from the Treasury, um, our population density has increased hugely. Um, that is a risk factor um, in terms of fraud where population increases dramatically, quickly and in, intense, intensively within certain areas. Um, the risk of fraud and corruption does rise. Wealth distribution, we're becoming a, a more unequal society in terms of wealth distribution. Again, that's a factor across the, across the globe in terms of rising perceptions of um, fraud and corruption. Diversity of cultural norms. What we've done, and again, you, you've seen this in the figures, immigration has driven a lot of our economy's performance. It's, it's done incredibly well on the back of it. And what we've done is we've introduced some really uh, diverse and, and unique and, and forward-thinking ways of doing business. They, they've diversified our economy, they've really driven things, and those great new ideas have pushed us along, and they're fantastic. But I think we're being a little bit naive if we think that um, one of our established factors, which is an established cultural norm of corruption not being okay within New Zealand, that that's just going to get absorbed by people coming into the country by osmosis. Uh, I, I don't think it is. Um, we have to do better about making sure our established norms that exist in New Zealand for how we do business are passed on, um, so that we're not just taking in good new ideas and ways of doing business and, and ignoring our own obligations. Um, the point of those two coloured globes, uh, the top one is basically, it's the Transparency International Index, um, demonstrating which countries are perceived as being corrupt and which ones are not. The darker the colour, the more corrupt it's perceived to be. And we're down, down there in a nice halo of perfection in the bottom right hand corner looking quite yellow. Um, so we're perceived as being not very corrupt along with the Scandinavian countries. Um, the issue with that is we can sit at the bottom right and say we're wonderful, um, we're not corrupt, aren't we, a, a, an island of perfection. Um, fine, but unless we're just going to trade with ourselves and just do business with ourselves, and again, the Auckland property market is probably an example of where we've tried to do that in order to get rich, it's, unless we're going to just do that and just engage with ourselves, we're going to have issues because the bottom uh, map um, sets out the countries that we have trading relationships, formal trading relationships, and are working on strengthening those in one way or another. The point there is, if we have business established trading links with other countries who do have a perception of corruption issue, and, and real corruption issues, if we're doing business with them, then, then that's still a risk. We are not just do, we live in a global economy. We're doing business with other people who have these issues, um, so we have to take that on board. The obvious point is we do have corruption. But in any event, even if we fooled ourselves that we don't, we're having to do business with other countries where it's definitely an issue. Um, what I would say, though, is, um, and going back to the first point, do we have corruption? We absolutely do. Um, what we don't have, when I, when I talk about it with, with other colleagues, is the type of corruption with money in a brown paper bag and people getting kidnapped and, and extortion happening on, on some dramatic scale, as you might see in, in, in TV um, or movies. Um, but we have more insidious corruption. What we have in New Zealand is a failure to recognise conflicts of interest. We have a failure to, and we might justify that to ourselves, and I hear these conversations all the time, that, look, I, I, you know, I have that interest, but, and yes, I went to school with that person, but that's a good thing, because I know they're the right person for the job. Yeah, I helped them out with the tender, but they were going to get it anyway, because they're the best person to do it. Um, a failure to declare interests and a failure to declare relationships. New Zealand's a village, it's a small place. If I can't do business with them, I might as well just shut up shop. These are just justifications and they're just not true. Other countries that are smaller than us deal with this better um, and those just aren't justifications. Um, so it's a complacency in understanding what corruption is because it can be as insidious as that um, and it can just be, I suppose, in terms of that complacency, what we see is it's led from the top. 
absolutely led from the top. You will very rarely have an instance where you go into an organisation and corruption has occurred um, where there hasn't been a slackness of process or gaps that have emerged which haven't been effectively sanctioned from the top in that those processes have been allowed to be avoided. It's very rare that that just happens. It's, it happens within an environment where that's seen as OK. Um, we have a difficulty in understanding the scale and extent of corruption in New Zealand, um, and, and the second and third bullet points probably go together, and this is some of the work that we need to do um, in order to get our heads around what corruption looks like in New Zealand. Um, we have um, some really great work that's being done in, in isolated areas of the public sector within New Zealand to prevent corruption, to prevent waste, error, um, and fraud generally. Um, and across the world, it's quite common that the two areas which government across the world invariably get right is tax, because that's where the money comes in, the sophistication across the globe of tax departments um, in terms of detecting fraud using artificial intelligence, analytics, and ensuring that the tax take is, is fair and not subject to an unacceptable level of fraud is, is astonishing. It's fantastic. Um, and the other one is benefits or social welfare or whatever any country around the world likes to call it, because that's where all the money goes out. Again, countries around the world are fantastic at ensuring controls exist around those, making sure it's good. But what we don't have is, um, and again, this, this is true across, across the globe, is linkages between those organisations so that those practices and those um, methodologies are being shared. There's isolated work being done where they understand the problem, the techniques being employed and the ways to stop it, and they aren't being shared across our public sector or across public sectors generally. Um, we need to do better on that. Uh, and the last one is where um, you... you pour out your sympathy for the, for the poor Auckland lawyer, which is that the size and nature of the complex fraud cases we're doing. We are not going to be able to arrest our way out of a fraud issue. Um, we never have been able to. That's, that's never been true. As I say, 12 prosecutions a year, important, but a blunt tool. But what's happening now is that the size and nature of cases is getting so big that that's becoming even more true, if, the, if that's logically possible. Um, a large case a few years ago was 10,000 documents. A large case now, we have a couple of cases sitting on our books that have an excess of 10 million documents. Um, and that's becoming more common. Um, two or three week trial was a large case, and now two or three month trial is a large case. Um, the nature of the legal challenges we face are getting more. Um, we are basically, we're having to work harder and engage more effort to do the same number of cases. And that's uh, only going to continue. It exists. That issue exists in a civil and a criminal context. Um, so unless the criminal law is going to get more efficient um, and more sensible, which just isn't going to happen, um, it's becoming more the case that we need a new approach. Um, and that approach has to be focusing on prevention. At the moment, uh, there, is, there is a real focus on, on prosecution of those large-scale cases, but not enough money and not enough time and effort is invested in a prevention model. That is seen as the world-class approach to um, how you engage with corruption and fraud within the public sector. The countries that are catching up with us and moving us down the Transparency International Index are doing exactly that. Dedicated anti-corruption agencies leading a coordinated approach across their public sector to prevent fraud. Alongside that, you need an agency who's prosecuting it appropriately because you always need that stick. Um, but that's where we need to head, a prevention model. In terms of what we're seeing, and I'll, I'll, I'll run through this only very briefly, but it, it picks out some of the examples of what are on our, have been on our books recently. Um, and uh, I suppose because I want this to be valuable for you guys at, at, a, at a detailed level as well, some of the things we saw that perhaps led to the fraud. The first one was... Um, the uh, Waitangi National Trust um, were defrauded by one of their financial controllers. Really simple thing, really. He, he was basically able to access other people's passwords and other people's approval passcodes for the accounting system and for other methods of approval through those people being sick and giving them their passwords, through those people leaving the organisations and not having those passwords closed down. Um, they continue to exist after they left. Um, and just not really good security, just a real trust environment rather than a process environment, um, and that allowed him to steal $1.2 million to spend on, uh, on himself. Um, the second one, home detention for, for the chap um, defrauding a government-funded disabilities trust. That was just an example where a, a person was able to push all of the trust's work to one supplier and get kickbacks from that supplier. It wouldn't have taken much scrutiny to see that the person or the organisation receiving all of the work for this trust 
wasn't qualified or able to do this work. It should have raised red flags, but, but it didn't. All the work went in that one direction um, and um, it was spotted far too late. The last one's one out of here in Christchurch where a couple uh, was doing what was on its face, um, incredibly noble work, providing um, developmental services for intellectually disabled people. Um, and they were able to, they were charged and, and pled guilty in the end to $500,000 worth of um, that charity's money, um, spending it on themselves. Uh, and yeah, it, it, there was probably a combination of factors. It, it was a strong personality, but also, and we see this a lot, where the purpose is noble and the, the work being done is good and looks on its face to be something that shouldn't be challenged. It isn't challenged. We're not very good in New Zealand at speaking up. Um, and across those top three, you had a combination of strong personalities. It's usually charm, sometimes it's bullying, but in any event, it's people who ride roughshod over processes um, and, and get away with it. The last couple are, are active investigations, so I won't go through them in any great detail, just to demonstrate a, a couple of issues we are seeing. The, the bottom left one, um, that relates to the education sector. Are we doing enough, really, um, to... Uh, determine, particularly in an environment where we're saying that um, we want to facilitate people's access to education, ensuring that the educational services that are being provided are actually the ones being provided. Is an 18-week course being done in one day? What controls exist to ensure that is the case? Um, and the last one just relates to, to procurement. Um, it's a massive risk area for, for New Zealand generally, and as I'll go on to demonstrate, we're, we're needing to do a lot of work around procurement um, because it's a huge area where New Zealand is losing money. In terms of red flags and things that we've seen, and this goes for probably most of our cases, but in particular in a public sector context, um, the things that we see, and, and, and I think you should look out for, isolated responsibility. And what I mean for that is people who hold relationships, contractual relationships or supplier relationships too close. They don't want anyone else to interfere in that relationship, to be on that phone call, to write that letter, to write that email. They hold that relationship incredibly closely. Um, that could be a quirk of their personality, fine, but that's also a real danger sign. If someone is holding that relationship so tightly they won't let others get involved, um, that's a risk. shouldn't be allowed to happen. Um, avoiding decision-making, approval or delegation processes, that's probably the biggest one. Um, what we see is often, on paper, some of the best processes you'll ever see. Wonderful stuff, but just not observed, either because I know this person, I trust this person, um, Commercially, we just have to move quicker. We can't, we can't be bothered with these processes. So-and-so's away, I have to do it, I have to approve this. No, I understand this, leave this with me. I've had, a, I've had a separate conversation, which means it's okay. All of those things, you could have someone who's just lazy and likes cutting corners, but that's something to detect in itself. But also, it could be so, a sign of something more insidious. Um, if those processes are there, they're there for a reason, they need to be observed. If those processes, you look at them, you say, look, they're not fit for purpose, change them. Don't ignore them. Make them better. If you've spotted ways in which oh, these are just this is just slowing us down, could be done so much better, do it better, but don't ignore them. And going back to my earlier point, that only happens and those corners only get cut if people in senior levels within the organisations make it okay for those corners to be cut. The next one, and this is a, a hobby horse of mine, is a failure to address and not manage conflicts of interest. I've heard repeatedly, and, and the noise is just getting louder over the last little while, people justifying conflicts of interest by saying they were managed. Yeah, I was in the room, I had a conversation around um, uh, the, the merits of, the, of the, the proposal, whatever it might be, but I didn't speak up for it. I wasn't advocating for it, I was just setting out facts. Or I was in the meeting for a little while and then I left for a little while and then came back. Managing conflicts is, is an area where New Zealand falls down hugely. Um, oftentimes the best way to manage it is they can't be managed. You avoid them. Managing it and putting steps in place that A, aren't effective and then B, aren't observed anyway. Um, the perception is terrible, even if there isn't impropriety, and it certainly raises the risk of impropriety occurring. So conflicts of interest, avoid them. Remove yourself from them, remove your organisation from them. Um, if you seek to manage them, that's a massive risk. Um, Unexplained wealth, uh, a couple of our investigators like doing a, a, a little slideshow where they show the car parks of, of people that they've caught and in amongst the Priuses and the Toyota Corollas are the Audi Q7s and the Porsche Cayens and my investigators who are a suspicious lot would happily handcuff them to their, their steering wheels and, and take them away on that basis alone. And I don't necessarily suggest that, although it's a, it's a free will, do it if you like. Um, but in and of itself, it's amazing the number of times we get it said to us after the fact that 
that person, I always wondered how they could sustain that lifestyle, they could have those trips, how they could live like they did when they're on the same wage as me. They're living the same way as me. How could they do that? I just like people to be wise before the event and not um, observe this to us um, after the fraud. Some, some pre-fraud observations would be great. Um, people who don't take time off, goes back to isolated responsibility. If people don't want to leave and just want to sit there and control a relationship or a contractual issue, that's, that's, a, big, um, that's a big risk area. Um, missing documents or records and lack in detail and voices. Again, that could be just because the person is slack um, and they're not very good at their job and uh, they just like cutting corners. Fine, that's one explanation, but also where you have missing documents or records and a failure to document processes that have happened, it raises the risk profile and it could be something more insidious. Now, none of these things taken in isolation represent you know, a definitive fraud, and even all of them don't. But if you're seeing a lot of these things, then it is something to inquire into further. Um, because the number of times we get told afterwards, we could tick these off when we're having a conversation. People after the event are great at spotting these things. Just in terms of our, our legal response, and um, I, I won't bore you with, with the legal detail on this too much, but it is just to demonstrate that we are trying to do something about this. At the moment, we have a public-private distinction in our legal framework with how we deal with fraud and, and corruption. Um, that's not the way it's dealt with internationally. I think that will go. We need to define what constitutes corrupt conduct better. At the moment, it's an amalgam of case law um, and uh, yeah, judicial-made definitions. We need to do better. We need to actually define corruption and allow me to bang this pulpit a bit better if I can just bring that up and say that's corruption. Um, clarifying corporate liability. At the moment, it's difficult in New Zealand to chase corporations who allow bri bribery or corruption to occur. Um, legally, it's tough. Um, we shouldn't be in that position where we're facing technical arguments if corrupt conduct has occurred at an organisational level, we should be able to pursue it. Creating a new offence for abuse of public office, again, we have technical arguments around a person sitting within a public office saying, yeah, this occurred, but it didn't lead directly to that tender being won, or I didn't directly take that piece of paper and pass it on to that person, which then resulted in a benefit. I'd rather not be able to, to have to join those legal dots. Sometimes the offence, the corruption is broader than that. It, it, it is an abuse of public office that that person is generally using their public office for a private gain. Um, again, that's the international standard. Um, and responding to international trends, facilitation payments, they're not okay in a foreign bribery context. Um, they shouldn't be, and we've diminished the circumstances in which they can be okay, should just be off the books. A facilitation payment being where you pay a little bit of money to make a process go quicker. At the moment on our statute books, in a foreign bribery context, that can be okay. It needs to go, it just looks bad. Um, and the requirement for the Attorney General's consent to prosecute, that's never been practically an issue, but he is, or she is, a political appointment, um, and so for New Zealand's perception's sake, we need to remove that um, and have it sitting down at a non-political level. Um, again, our international reputation suggests that we need to do that taking a consistent approach to penalties and adopting a non-prosecutorial mindset. Again, if we just keep trying to arrest our way out of the fraud problem, we're not going to win. And lastly, just the systemic response, and this is the anti-corruption work program that the SFO is, is leading across the um, public sector. What we're trying to do at the moment is develop a sheer understanding of corruption in New Zealand. So we're at the data gathering phase. Um, once we have that information, what we're trying to do at the moment is review the controls for the allocation and expenditure of public money. And that's for central and local government um, because the controls that exist in there at the moment are often directed at getting value for money, but are they directed specifically at fraud and corruption? Um, and we don't think they are. Um, we're working with Auckland Council, who had their own issue with the Auckland transport bribery case, um, and they have uh, amended significantly their procurement controls. So we're in there at the moment looking at the before and after effects of that. Um, we're designing a framework to measure the value of the savings. If we want to be able to sell to um, the powers that be the fact that a prevention model is world class, that's fine. One good argument is that other countries are doing it, why shouldn't we? But a better argument, as I'm sure you'll all appreciate, is it gets money. It saves money. It makes sure the money that is coming in to go to that place which is worthy is actually going there. It isn't getting ticked along the way. Um, and the last one is we want to implement an engagement program so that the good work that we're trying to do within the public sector and that we're um, in the middle of trying to do at the moment um, has a wider impact. So how do we disseminate that out across the private sector? Um, if we can do all of that and if we can shake some of our complacency, then we will move forward and we can keep our place at the top of the transparency index.